Continuing from part one, I'm now going to look at some other behaviours that orcas exhibit when imprisoned in a concrete tank and the controversy surrounding breeding in captivity. Many orca engage in self-harming behaviour, such as stranding themselves. This has been observed to be from 5 minutes up to as long as 30 minutes. One orca has even leapt out of its tank. This is an incredibly harmful behaviour as their skin dries out rapidly and they become dehydrated. Pressure is exerted on their internal organs and muscles are damaged. Another harmful behaviour that has been observed is that of regurgitating their food after feeding and then playing with it. The stomach acid damages the lining of the esophagus and their teeth, just like in humans, suffering from bulimia. Orcas have also been observed to ram their heads or bodies into walls or gates. In 1970, an orca called Hugo really hurt himself doing this and had to undergo a 45-minute operation without anaesthetic to stitch a piece of flesh back onto his rostrum. Ten years later, the 15-year-old self-harming causes his death after he hit his head into the tank wall and suffered a brain aneurysm. Another harmful behaviour exhibited by captive orcas is that of chewing the sides of concrete tanks or metal bars out of sheer boredom or as a sign of regression. Tooth degradation occurs in wild orcas. It is linked to the type of prey that they eat, with some populations, such as those that hunt and eat sharks, having their teeth worn down more quickly than orcas that feed on fish and it is a slow process occurring over decades. In captivity, due to the orcas chewing concrete and metal, tooth degradation occurs within years and starts at a very young age. A study has shown that approximately 24% of whales exhibit major to extreme wearing of their teeth on the lower jaw and some of the teeth were fractured. When the teeth are severely worn down, Orcas undergo a process called a pulpotomy, where the pulp in the crown of the tooth is removed using a drill, a very painful procedure performed without anaesthetic. The subsequent hole then needs to be flushed out up to three times a day to remove food blocking it to prevent abscesses forming, bacteremia, which is the presence of bacteria in the blood, and sepsis. The final aspect I want to discuss is that of breeding in captivity. Many of the orca that are held captive at the present time have been born in captivity. France, Canada and California in the US have discontinued breeding orcas in captivity, as has SeaWorld theme parks, which is to be celebrated. Although some natural pregnancies have occurred, it has also been as the result of the female being penned in a small area with a sexually frustrated male. Many pregnancies have occurred by artificial insemination, not the nicest of procedures. But what I find so sad is the number of miscarriages that occur or calves that die at a very young age. Since 1977, 70 orcas have been born in captivity, 37 of them are now dead. Another 30 calves were still born or died in utero. Females reach sexual maturity when they are between 10 and 13 years old. In the wild, they typically don't have a calf until they are 13 when they are both sexually and socially mature to cope with a pregnancy and successfully rear a calf. In captivity, the average age of pregnancy is 11 years of age. Some have been as young as 8. As well as being younger, they also do not have the support mechanisms to help them rear a calf that are in place in the wild. Grandmothers and other female members of the pod all help in the rearing of the calf, passing on their experience to the young mother. In the wild, orcas may have a calf every five years. Although the calf is weaned at around two years, the mother does not have another calf for another three, enabling her to give her full attention to the calf, making sure that it develops social and behavioural skills necessary for its survival. The average calving interval for orcas in captivity is three years and nine months, clearly much shorter than in the wild. There have also been five inbred orcas born in captivity. This is very rare in wild populations, as orcas have behaviours which prevent it from occurring. Another thing that does not occur in wild populations, as the orcas never meet, is hybrids. There are eight Icelandic Biggs transient hybrids and three Icelandic Argentinian transit hybrids. And the other thing that doesn't happen in the wild is that of a mother and calf being separated. At the present time, there are 19 mothers and calves that have been separated and are now in different facilities. Separation also occurs when orcas are captured from the wild and removed from the pod. A fascinating discovery is that in the wild, young males are three times more likely to die the year after their mother's death than were males whose mothers were still around. The risk for males over 30 years of age increased eightfold. For young daughters, the risk did not increase, 
but older daughters were 2.7 times more likely to die. It is not surprising then that orcas around the world are suffering chronic stress. Everything that they are subjected to should haunt us. The consequences of being kidnapped from their family and having their liberty taken away are far-reaching, even resulting in the acts of aggression and self-harm. And on top of all that, they are asked to perform tricks for the public, day in, day out. So what can be done about this? Well, Canada and France and the SeaWorld theme parks no longer capture or buy orcas from the wild and are committed to ending breeding in captivity, which is great news. These countries and the SeaWorld theme parks are also committed to changing the style of their orca shows so that orcas perform less tricks and focus more on natural behaviours and education. However, they are still being subjected to the public watching them perform on a daily basis. As discussed in my video on the cruelty of China's ocean theme parks, China is building more dolphinariums and these need to be filled with cetaceans, either taken from the wild or bred in captivity. With continued public pressure within China itself and around the world, I hope that China will join the movement that is happening on the rest of the planet and change its mindset regarding the keeping of cetaceans in captivity. It is my greatest wish that rather than live their lives out in captivity, that some of the orcas and other cetaceans such as beluga whales and bottlenose dolphins will be able to be released into whale sanctuaries. This was the case in September of this year, when two beluga whales, Little White and Little Grey, were finally released into the salty waters of their new home. After being in captivity for 10 years in Russia and then in China, they are now residing in the chilly waters of Iceland in their very own sanctuary. The Sea Life Trust Beluga Whale Sanctuary is the first whale sanctuary of its kind and it is hoped that the two whales will be joined by others. This was a very important proof of concept and seems to have been successful. The Whale Sanctuary Project is another charity hoping to find a new home for captive cetaceans. Its mission is to establish a model seaside sanctuary where whales and dolphins can be rehabilitated or can live permanently in an environment that maximises well-being and autonomy and is as close as possible to their natural habitat. After much searching, a site has been chosen in Port Hilford, Nova Scotia. The hope is that up to eight belugas will be able to live there. If suitable places can be found for whale sanctuaries and the money found to build and maintain them and to care for the cetaceans, perhaps there is a future where these beautiful creatures can live out their last days in relative freedom and there will be no more cetaceans kept in captivity. What a wonderful future that would be.